There are so many types of bacterial beta-lactamases, from narrow-spectrum blazet and staphylococci, all the way up to the broadest-spectrum carbapenemases. In today's lecture, we're going to focus on the ESBLs and carbapenemases, and I'm going to try and demystify some of the diversity we see in these enzymes. We're going to start today's lecture by going back to this old figure we've seen a few times in the past. So antibiotics attack these physiological processes or bacterial anatomy that's as unique to prokaryotes as possible. And our beta-lactams act by interfering with cell wall synthesis. Our beta-lactam type drugs are incredibly important. These are the most commonly used antimicrobials in companion animals. They're also very important, important in production animal medicine and critically important for human health as well. So within the whole superfamily, our penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems, um, these drugs are safe. They're effective. We have preparations which are orally bioavailable, and they have a broad spectrum of activity. So there's many applications where the beta-lactams are um, used. But these are compounds which bacteria have developed countermeasures for, these beta-lactamases. So enzymes which are able to hydrolyze the four-membered beta-lactam ring, inactivating the drug, and preventing it from killing the organism. There are, however, many types of beta-lactamases. We can group them into four classes, class A through D, and within each of these families, we have enzymes that have some shared characteristics. So our class A, C, and D enzymes are serine beta-lactamases, while class B are metallo-beta-lactamases. Class A includes many of our narrow-spectrum gram-positive enzymes, our penicillinases, and our TEM, SHV, and CTXM type uh, enzymes and gram-negatives. We also see how the KPC, SME, and GES type carbapenemases falling within class A. Within our class B, we have a number of very important carbapenemases, so NDM, VIM, and IMP. Class C, these are our AMP C type enzymes, most importantly, uh, CMY. And then our oxacillinases in class D, which as a class have a highly variable hydrolytic spectrum. If we look at these enzymes in a different way, more the, the way that we talk about them, uh, we have our ESBLs, our, expend, our extended spectrum beta-lactamases. These are class A and include our broad spectrum TEM and SHV type beta-lactamases. Um, so these are ones which have evolved from narrow spectrum TEM and SHV and our CTXM enzymes. These enzymes have a hydrolytic activity that includes the penicillins, cephalosporins, and monobactams but can be inhibited in vitro with our classical beta-lactamase inhibitors, so clavulanic acid, tazobactam, and selbactam. Our AMP-C enzymes are class C beta-lactamases, and as I said, these include things like CMY. In addition to the penicillin, cephalosporins, and monobactams, these enzymes are also able to degrade our cefamycin, so drugs like cefoxetin. In vitro, we can inhibit our uh, AMP-C enzymes with cloxacillin or boronic acid, and then on the bottom here, we have our different types of carbapenemases. There are many different enzymes with carbapenem degrading activity, including a number of our metalloenzymes, our VIM, IMP, and NDM, our class A, so our KPCs, and then we have oxacillinases capable of hydrolyzing carbapenems as well. When it comes to our ESBLs and carbapenemases, these are really a gram-negative problem. So it's almost the flip side of the methicillin resistance uh, coin. So that's a huge problem um, in our staphylococci. Here we're talking about kind of the next big thing in the gram-negative world. I think in veterinary medicine and particularly in companion animals, there's a lack of awareness about these beta-lactamases and the implications of the different types of beta-lactamases for therapeutic selection. Um, we know really remarkably little about the incidence and distribution of these mechanisms in animals, and especially, again, in companion animals and wildlife. So there are some types of beta-lactamases which we can inhibit. So we have our beta-lactam drug here. 
The beta-lactamase produced by the organism comes along, tries to degrade it, but our beta-lactamase inhibitor binds it up, leaving the drug free to have its mechanism of action. Um, this is not something that we can do for every type of beta-lactamase. So we'll just go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, clavulanic acid, solbactam, and tazobactam are three commonly used uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors. Um, these are able to inhibit narrow-spectrum class A beta-lactamases in the patient, so only that one subset. More recently, we've seen the introduction of avibactam with uh, ceftazidime, so a cephalosporin, which is active against a wider spectrum of enzymes, including class A's, but also C's and D's. Ceftazidime avibactam is a critically important drug for human health and should not be used by veterinarians. If we consider the impact of ESBL producing um, enterobacteriales, um, it is great. So this is a, a figure from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, estimating that there's almost 200,000 patients hospitalized annually with these infections, over 9,000 deaths, and then a massive economic cost as well. So $1.2 billion in attributable healthcare costs. So a huge human cost, mortality burden, and also a financial burden. Our extended spectrum beta-lactamases, as I said, are class A enzymes. In vitro, so in the lab, we can inhibit them with beta-lactamase inhibitors, although penicillin beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations are not used for treating infections in these patients. The key phenotype associated with our ESBLs is resistance to the oxyimmunocephalosporins, so these are our third-generation cephalosporins, and there's two main groups of ESBLs that I want to mention. Um, one are those TAM and SHV type. These evolved from narrow-spectrum TAM and SHVs and really predominated in the 1980s. More recently, and up through today, we have the CTXM type ESBLs. Um, interestingly, the first one was actually detected from a dog in the 1980s in Japan, um, which was uh, an experimental animal used in pharmacokinetic studies. So the dog was given antibiotics, and then various pharmacokinetic measures were taken. The CTXM enzymes are thought to have disseminated from Cluvera species, so this is a genus within the Enterobacteriales. The epidemiology of the ESBLs and also the carbapenemases is quite interesting. Um, I find the travel associations particularly fascinating. So travel from low incidence countries, like fortunately Canada, um, to higher prevalence regions of the world is a risk factor for colonization with resistant E. coli or other enterobacteriales. So I really like to travel and have had the opportunity to visit um, India on a number of occasions. Um, when I went in 2017, I decided to do a little self-experiment. So before my trip, I collected a swab and another one on my return. And when I cultured these, it seemed that I may have come back with a little extra souvenir. So before leaving, I was colonized with E. coli. Not surprisingly, most of us are. Um, this was a fairly wimpy strain. It was only resistant to tetracycline. On return, I had an E. coli, um, which I grew from Chromagar ESBL, so a selective and differential media. It was resistant to ampicillin, ceftriaxone, and ciprofloxacin, which is really a classical phenotype associated with CTXM producing strains. And indeed, when we did the PCR, um, you can see here, here's our CTXM positive control, my pre-travel isolates, which had no band, no CTXM gene, and then the post-travel isolates um, did have a CTXM. So I picked up one of these organisms uh, during my travels. Next, I briefly want to mention the carbapenemases. The carbapenems are really one of our last lines of defense against otherwise resistant gram-negative pathogens. These are broad-spectrum drugs, and they are critically important to human health. So something that any of you as future veterinarians will not be tempted to use. These enzymes are capable of degrading the vast majority of beta-lactam drugs, and there's a number of different enzymes with carbapenem degrading activity. So our KPC type and our metalloenzymes are some of our broadest spectrum. And then we have oxacillinases, which variably degrade other non-carbapenem beta-lactams. 
What's interesting about uh, the carbapenemases is that they also have really interesting and distinct epidemiological characteristics that I'll go into in the next few slides. But the carbapenemases are really our worst nightmare. Um, when we talk about the post-antibiotic era, getting into a time when we don't have uh, reasonable treatment options left available to us, these are the bugs we are discussing. Um, they are often multidrug resistant and sometimes pan resistant, so no therapeutic options left available. Another infographic from the CDC um, describing carbapenem uh, resistant enterobacteriales, um, 13,000 cases um, in 2017, 1,100 deaths, and 130 million in attributable healthcare costs. So at this point, lower than our ESBLs, but these have more recently really emerged than our ESBLs. So it's continuing to become more common and again, causing a human cost and an economic cost. First, I wanted to just briefly discuss NDM or the New Delhi metallobetalactamase. This was first reported in 2008 from a 59-year-old male Swedish patient. Um, this man was diabetic. He'd suffered multiple strokes. He had decubital ulcers or bed sores and a urinary tract infection with an ESBL producing Klebsiella pneumoniae. Now in Sweden at the time, an infection with an ESBL producer would prompt um, some screening and some epidemiological investigations in order to follow up and determine where this strain came from. And so they took a rectal swab from this patient um, to see if he was colonized with this ESBL producing Klebsiella. And instead, what they found was a carbapenem resistant E. coli. On questioning him further, they found that he had a recent history of hospitalization in India. The association with India is really obviously where the name comes from, the New Delhi metallobetalactamase. Um, it's since disseminated globally, um, and we have other endemic foci, so it's no longer uh, limited to South Asia. There is an association with travel to the Indian subcontinent, whether it's uh, travel for pleasure or medical tourism. Um, it has been shown to be widely disseminated in the environment, so you don't have to be in a healthcare setting in order to come into contact with NDM-producing organisms. NDM producers have also been found in livestock in China and other parts of the world, and this is something that really is rapidly evolving. We're seeing the epidemiology of NDM-producing bacteria continue to evolve. It's being found in more and more places, um, other endemic foci are developing, and it's disseminating into other species. So we're finding it kind of all over the place. Um, this is perhaps not surprising when we consider what a globalized world we live in. The background image here is one that I took on a plane coming into land in Singapore. And I think you can see all of the ships waiting in the harbor to be loaded or unloaded. And then, of course, me coming on a plane into Singapore just really highlights how rapidly we're able to move around the world, perhaps inadvertently bringing resistant organisms along with us. One thing that's been really frustrating and interesting about NDM1 is that it tends to be found on broad host range plasmids. So the plasmids containing this resistance gene are able to disseminate across many different bacteria, certainly the enterobacteriales and also into non-fermenters, and it makes tracking the spread of this organism quite difficult. Dissemination is really due to lateral gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer, than a particular uh, successful bacterial clone. I also wanted to talk quickly about the KPC enzyme or the Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase. Um, in contrast to NDM, this is found on a narrow host range plasmid, which tends to be associated with even particular strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae. This one was first identified in the late 90s in the northeastern United States in, of course, a Klebsiella pneumoniae. And from there, it spread all over the world. So first to Israel and Puerto Rico. Um, from New York, it continued to spread to Eastern Europe, so Greece, and from Israel to Colombia. And then we saw it move into Northern Europe and Canada. Currently, hotspots remain in the northeastern United States, Colombia, the Eastern Mediterranean region, so Israel and Greece, as well as Southeast China. 